Hello, welcome again to BipolarCast. This is a podcast where we speak about metabolic therapies for bipolar disorder. Uh, Matt and I both have lived experience of bipolar disorder and we speak to people who have lived experience and experts in metabolic psychiatry and neuroscience. Uh, today, we're super excited to be talking to Dr. Dominic D'Agostino, who's an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Pharmacology and Physiology at the University of South Florida. He's a research scientist at the Institute for Human and Machine Cognition and co-host of the Metabolic Health Summit. His laboratory develops and tests metabolic-based strategies for targeting seizure disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, and cancer. His laboratory develops, and um, he, the main focus of his lab over the past 12 years has uh, been the investigation of anticonvulsant and neuroprotective mechanisms of ketogenic diet and ketone metabolite supplementation. Other areas of interest include researching metabolic-based drugs for cancer. He was a research investigator and crew member on NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operation NEMO 22, and has a personal interest in environmental medicine and methods to enhance safety and physical Logical resilience in extreme environments. His research is supported by the Office of Naval Research, Department of Defense, private organizations, and foundations. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Dom. Thank you for having me, Ian and Matt. I appreciate uh, what you guys are doing with this podcast, creating this platform, and the courageous advocacy you're doing around this topic. Uh, I appreciate being on. That um, bio is pretty much as close to Iron Man as we're ever going to get on this show, <laughs> like uh, working for NASA, working in human machine cognition as a neuroscientist. Um, how did you, um, so I guess one of the things I'd love to ask is uh, you have such a diverse range of interests. Um, how did you become involved with NASA? That, um... uh, yeah, good question. I, um, so I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship through the Office of Navy Research, developing different hyperbaric technologies, including uh, atomic force microscopy and laser scan and confocal, putting them inside these environmental chambers and uh, starting to understand the mitochondrial sort of dysfunctional origin to oxygen toxicity seizures, which is a limitation for Navy SEAL divers. And in the process of doing that and, and looking at different uh, uh, neuroprotective agents, uh, you know, ran across the ketogenic diet and then ketones, and then the work that was funded by the Department of Defense and the Navy uh, was an extreme environment and space is an extreme environment. And through my work with Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, I was invited. There's a lot of overlap between the undersea environment and space environment in regards to extreme, you know, extreme environment, but enclosed habitats and alteration of, you know, partial pressures and things like that. So I got invited to this uh, workshop and it connected me with uh, several workshops like with NASA. And then um, one thing led to another and I met the director of uh, the NASA's extreme environment mission operations. And, uh, and out of the blue, I, I got, uh, you know, called, <laughs> invited to be a research scientist that would train with and live with astronauts that were training. Uh, uh, three or uh, three of them just came down from SpaceX crew four. They were on the International Space Station for about a half mm -hmm. a year. We watched them go up and they just landed. Uh, SpaceX crew four just landed. And that's Shell Lindgren, Samantha Christoparetti, an ESA astronaut, and Jessica Watkins, uh, who will probably be people that will go to Mars too. So it was really fun to train with them to uh, stab their finger and, and take blood ketone levels and, you know, microbiome samples. We did a lot of physiology on them, but uh, it evolved out of the work with the Navy, uh, which was the ketogenic diet work kind of led me to NASA. I guess ketones led me to NASA in a, in a, in a circuitous way, I would say. That's a pretty awesome journey. <clears throat> Do you have any aspirations to go to Mars? Is this something on your calendar? <laughs> I don't. I don't think my my wife would let me. Uh, she's probably more uh, probably uh, more cut out for doing that sort of thing. She's very good operationally. She was a dive master for many years. She's also a neuroscientist and and is very comfortable underwater and stuff. But uh, you know, I just like to do the science and then support ground based. Uh, you know, research that can enhance uh, and preserve what we call uh, what we call perform performance resilience. So when you put people in extreme environments, that could be psychological, that could be environmental, that could be, you know, uh, there's a breakdown of things like team cognition, where people just don't work as good together. Uh, 
And I, I'd like to do the ground-based research. Hey, if the opportunity comes up to do like a space tourist or something like that, I would, but, uh, but I'm more of a, a scientist working in the trenches, but it was, it was great because the, the Aquarius habitat and the Nemo analog mission is really the only space analog that uses astronauts, you know, for their training. So it was really an honor and a privilege to, to serve on that. And I was uh, a crew member on Nemo 22. My wife was a crew member on Nemo 23. So that was an all female crew. So it, it's been, it's been great. And a lot of insights and tests that we did on that, that mission, including the general anxiety test seven, GAD seven, PHQ nine, sleep, the aura ring, the aura stepped up and actually gave us a uh, NASA, like uh, the aura ring, we used the polar V 800 to look at heart rate variability. So the test that we used for that, those experiments, and there was quite a few, I think there was five or six IRB protocols that I was PI on that had to go through NASA and ESA. And it was an IRB writing challenge, but we got them all through. But a lot of those tests, uh, we have a big interest in uh, mental health because mental health is probably the most important thing that needs to be researched and studied for long duration space flight. Like no one would argue that. <laughs> and that's, uh, those experiments have actually uh, been incorporated into the studies that we're doing now. Uh, funded in part by the Bazaki Foundation, which is actually expanding upon looking at uh, mental health. M metabolic health is intimately coupled to mental health. I think we all agree on that. Uh, the mainstream science uh, needs more data on that. So we do research basic science, clinical science, and also education outreach through the Metabolic Health Summit. And I think what you guys are doing with education outreach has been underappreciated. And I think it needs, we need more education outreach to get the message out there. I mean, it's, it's as important as the clinical trials and as important, the basic science, you know, is what builds the clinical trials, but it's that education outreach and getting the information out there. So important. And this is <clears> interesting. Yeah. Are there actually like physiological changes as a result of physical changes that allow people to perform better in these extreme environments? Physiolo I, you cut out on me a little bit, but your question was the physiological changes with the diet or with the... As a result of the diet, as a result of being in ketosis, are there changes that happen, physical changes in people's bodies that allow them to perform better in these environments? Yeah. So, uh, well, that's, that's kind of being studied now, but what we do understand is that when you're in a state of therapeutic ketosis, as you would with a ketogenic diet, it has an anti convulsant effect. So in the context of environments that could trigger a seizure, <laughs> oxygen toxicity, yes. Uh, there's also, uh, changes when we change metabolic physiology, we change brain neuropharmacology and brain energy systems, right? So that becomes uh, having the uh, shifting the brain chemistry and shifting the energetic systems of the brain to use ketones can provide uh, an adva a neuroprotective advantage in the context of limited oxygen availability. It changes respiratory qu quotient. So you have less CO2 production. This is like really important for, you know, enclosed habitats. Uh, the CO2 in environments about 10 times higher uh, in, in like uh, in the International Space Station. And it will be even with the scrubber systems. So that those physiological changes can help us, can protect us against those extreme environments. And I think the next frontier is to look at like muscle wasting. Ketones can have anti-catabolic effects. Uh, especially when it's coupled with resistance training, uh, uh, protein sparing muscle, you know, anti-catabolic effects. So this, and I think the big thing we're working on now is like space radiation. We're gearing up to do like a, some experiments in mice at Brookhaven National Labs, which is like simulate space radiation. And we want to do some ketone experiments uh, ultimately on that. So the answer to your question in a very roundabout way, uh, I, I think there are 
the ketogenic diet is pleiotropic and there are a variety of things that happen very acutely from the metabolic uh, physiology perspective and then from brain energy. But then a lot of things that are happening in the realm of ketone signaling, as far as a suppression of the NLRP3 inflammasome, uh, which is linked to like neuroinflammation. Uh, and the, the projects that we are running in the lab now are looking at epigenetic regulation. So it's probably a little too early for me to talk about these things because we're actively doing them. Like as we speak right now, running experiments in mice uh, and looking at how metabolites can directly impact gene expression by interacting with the histones and turning on, uh, turning on neuroprotective pathways, but turning on uh, mechanisms in the body that boost endogenous antioxidant uh, capacity. And, and I think that's, uh, I mean, these are basic science research and it's going to take a while to, for this to translate into human studies, but it has high relevance to the space environment. What you said about <clears throat> increased um, CO2 is really interesting because I've always thought that the mood states and bipolar, particularly depression, are, are much more severe uh, physiological states than anyone is aware of in the literature has ever been written about. Like when you experience these in real life, people go through these catatonic depressions where they, they can't move for weeks on end. They literally won't be able to leave their room yeah. or their house. And the, 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 the closest thing I can describe it to is it feels like being deprived of oxygen. It really feels <clears throat> like you're being deprived of oxygen and your body is in this state that is just barely surviving. And you often see on bipolar forums, people write um, that it feels like drowning and they draw this. They, if, if they draw pictures of how depression feels, they often draw being underwater and un being able to get, uh, get their head above water. And it's really interesting because even since the 1970s, they've detected high levels of lactate in the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid of people with bipolar. And there's some, um, the body's like going into glycolysis. It's, it's not using oxygen phosphorylation in the same way. Uh, I feel like there must be some analogy between what you're saying about this um, extreme environment and the depression that people experience in bipolar is almost like a state of hypoxia. And it really feels like that. And there's the indications of that in the, the biomarkers. Um, so uh, so what I've, I found really fascinating, because I, I first heard um, about your work through um, uh, Bulletproof Radio about seven years ago, you did this interview and you're talking about CNS oxygen toxicity. And at the time I just, um, I'd been going on a sort of like strict Atkins diet and I was experiencing this um, remission of symptoms that I'd never had on any medication throughout my whole life uh, going into ketosis. I wasn't even aware really that it was ketosis at the time. I just knew something had changed. And when you're saying about this oxygen toxicity, I thought, I wonder if there's some parallel between what you're describing, because we use anticonvulsants, you know, anti-seizure drugs yeah. and bipolar. And you were talking about how these are the standard treatment for Navy divers, but you're actually finding ketosis. Can you see parallels between perhaps some of these physiological states in uh, psychiatric conditions and this um, and what you're describing about um, the effects of ketosis and the benefits for reduced oxygen environments? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, to get, you know, to the question with the anti-epileptic drugs being used for bipolar, uh, I know uh, Keppra uh, is, is uh, the mechanism of action of Keppra is kind of unique. It's like the SV2A uh, uh, mechanism. It's like a synaptic packaging, but, it, but there's a GABAergic component to that uh, too. So uh, Keppra Vigabatrin uh, is also... Uh, that actually can boost levels of GABA and work that I think Susan Massino had done, or maybe David Ruskin, and then uh, a few other people suggested that the ketogenic diet was working through a GABAergic mechanism. And some of the work that we did, I don't think we published a lot of it, but we did publish one in a model of Angelman syndrome showing that similar to anti-epileptic anti drugs, using a ketone ester and administering the ketone ester with a standard diet, that there was an increase in the GAD 65 and 67. So glutamic acid decarboxylase converts, you know, glutamate to GABA, and then GABA levels were elevated by virtue of the enzymatic conversion. So more excitatory neurotransmitter into uh, to GABA, which is a, uh, I think about it as like a brain stabilizing neurotransmitter that stabilizes synaptic activity. And for bipolar one, yeah, I know uh, 
you know, the anti-epileptic drugs are commonly used and then uh, other, uh, the, which can be problematic. And then you have the atypical antipsychotics like uh, Zyprexa. And I teach all the, the antipsychotics, the, the, the typicals and the atypicals. And now I've expanded the, the metabolic effects of uh, the atypicals quite considerably since I started teaching this because a lot more information came out, the, the, they directly inhibit. And you mentioned lactate. So what I think is happening, which is in line with uh, Dr. Palmer's book here, which is uh, supporting my microphone here, I, got, I bought copies of them for the, for the whole app, uh, is that it's a, it's a brain energy problem. And, and the elevation of lactate is basically uh, uh, the canary in the coal mine. And it's, it's suggestive of a decrease in glucose oxidation uh, glucose, you know, mitochondrial oxidation of glucose via uh, a number of different pathways and probably the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, which is kind of a rate limiting enzyme. And then that the mitochondrial function backs up and you get more glucose shuttle to glycolysis and an elevation of lactate. And we see this in pretty much all metabolic disorders and neurodegenerative disorders are pathophysiologically linked to this energy suppression or dysregulation where we start, we see an elevation of lactate and the ketones being in a state of ketosis can reverse that. And, uh, and even administering a ketone ester can bring down lactate, even lactate in response and elevation of lactate in response to exercise. It can lower that pretty significantly. Yeah. Do we know how significant because you mentioned something that piqued my interest and that I've been thinking about for a long time, which is the effects of these atypicals on metabolism. Do we know how significant that is? Uh, it's quite significant. In I mean, it's uh, the the weight gain is indicative of the significance of the insulin resistance by many of the atypical antipsychotics. Uh, it is still a mystery because, because I have to teach the subject and I struggle to a little bit mechanistically to explain uh, the, the link, the, how these atypicals are causing insulin resistance. I think it's, I think it's pretty complicated, but uh, weight gain is pretty ubiquitous side effect that many people have. Uh, another psychiatric disorder that my colleague at the University, uh, Deanna Rancourt studies, uh, eating uh, disordered eating and anorexia, actually the atypical uh, are given to patients with anorexia to get them to gain weight faster. I mean, it's like, it's a very well-established side effect. And uh, it's a little bit unfortunate because, you know, they do work in, in many cases, they do work, but they could also make the situation worse. Because as I mentioned, metabolic health is intimately coupled to mental health. And, and I think that they're, Efficacy tends to be upfront, and then there's like a protracted metabolic dysregulation through insulin resistance that can make the situation worse if it's not uh, addressed. I mean, people need to really adjust their diet and increase exercise, which are two things that really help a lot too. But uh, but these drugs can do more harm than good, and and I think. You know, it was the patients that really guided my my research on ketogenic diets because I was communicating with a patient in the UK, Mike Dancer, who has been a speaker before at Metabolic Health Summit, and I was I was really focused on GABA and actually delivering GABA as like a, a phenylated GABA, like with phenybut or uh, various GABA ergic compounds. I was really focusing on. And then I discovered the ketogenic diet actually through the work of Zhang Ro, who is one of our keynote speakers, and he's been an icon for me in the field. But it was communicating with patients who were like at wit's end going into surgery on their brain and then recommending the ketogenic diet and then getting back to me and saying, you know, I've went three or four months without having a seizure. And, and then it was a number of patients, even with Alzheimer's disease that, uh, were responding back like Dr. Mary Newport's husband, Steve Newport, who actually became a, a guest speaker in some of my classes and speaks at the, at the university here that convinced me that uh, a dietary intervention was not a trivial thing that you can significantly change, you know, brain energy metabolism by virtue of 
an increase in performance on an Alzheimer's test, like the clock test or mini mental status test, or by quickly putting someone with drug resistant epilepsy into remission. So I was absolutely fascinated with this. I trained as a physiologist and neuroscientist, but my undergrad was actually nutrition. So I became super excited to bring nutrition back into my research platform. And it was a very incremental way that I did this, but once it start, once we started getting data, it was like data that was better than any drug that we ever tested with drugs. The data was all over the place with the ketogenic therapies. It was like working for, had an anxiolytic effect. It had an anti-cancer effect. It had like, you know, uh, an Alzheimer's effect. And it was just amazing that I stumbled upon this thing that was working in, in so many different areas. Thank you for, <clears throat> and, and thank you for sharing all those things so early on as well, because you were talking about this, uh, you know, a long way, way back when this was hardly anyone had even heard of this. And I was having these benefits from a uh, very strict Atkins diet. I was doing very high protein at the time. I, and I didn't even understand that ketosis, what was, what was being beneficial. But one of the things I got really excited about is in this interview um, uh, that I listened to where you're talking about your research, you were saying how neuronal membrane potentials and things in the brain, like really physical aspects, biological aspects of the brain are affected by ketosis. And that was when it was the first time I felt like, ah, this is actually something um, that I can see that about this kind of Atkins approach that could be affecting the brain in a serious way. And then I went more <clears throat> strict here. I think I followed the kind of protocol I went on the Bulletproof website after and I did that for uh, about two years and um, and then I found kind of more like medical type ketogenic diets after that but it was that um, seeing that this can have real effects on membrane potentials in the brain that got me excited because I thought this is excitability of the brain which is yeah. so core to bipolar disorder and your the excitability of your brain is obviously on a kind of modulating um, very strongly compared to how it should and um, so uh, and what also is really uh, exciting to hear is you saying about lactate being a canary in the coal mine because this yeah. is something I feel is really underrecognized that this uh, bipolar affects the whole body and the whole system and they've detected this for a long time since the 1960s 1970s going around towards taking blood samples and seeing elevated lactate in all these patients and there's loads of systematic reviews and uh, that have showed uh, since then that this is the most common biomarker for bipolar disorder um, and i've always hoped that this would be seen yeah. as an indication of something we could look into so it's really exciting to hear you say that could, could you perhaps say more about um, the effects of ketosis on neuronal membrane potential and, and what you saw with seizure reduction yeah, great. So, uh, so membrane potential is very near and dear to my heart because that's I did my whole PhD uh, on uh, in neurons and in tissue uh, tissue slices of brains and, and cultured neurons, measuring directly measuring membrane potential with a technique called uh, patch clamp electrophysiology, and uh, and I used a particular version of uh, patch clamp, which is called whole cell perforated patch, where you take a microelectrode. And it goes on to the membrane of a neuron uh, or different cells, uh, but mostly what I studied was neurons. And then you gain electrical act, you seal onto it and you make what's called a giga ohm seal. <laughs> you apply literally like suction through like a little tube connected to it and you seal onto the plasma membrane. And then you have nystatin in the, in the, the micro pipette. And, uh, and that gains electrical access. And then you measure uh, a membrane potential, which is usually about 60, uh, 55 to like 65, somewhere around that range of the neurons. And it becomes uh, an, a really cool technique to measure the resilience of the brain cells in response to different toxins, in response to great levels of oxygen and pressure, which we do in the lab. Uh, I did my PhD on hypoxia, but we also use chemical uh, uh, poisons like cyanide. So I was using like sodium cyanide at graded levels and poisoning the cells. And then went on to like, you know, throwing on glutamate and other toxins that would simulate, uh, you know, different, different disease states. And what became apparent to me is that if you give the, the brain cells, an alternative form of energy at the time, I was very focused on lactate actually delivering. I was, I was very much into mountain biking when I was younger and I was using a product called Cytomax, which had alpha L polylactate. So it was like, I was like, I wanted to study this, but then I got, which I had some, you know, data that was, you know, okay on that. I never published it, but, uh, but then I got, I got steered on to ketones. Cause I realized that, you know, 
uh, I stumbled upon George Cahill's work and Dr. Uh, Richard Veach, who is like sort of a, a thought leader in the field of ketones. And as we are applying to keep the ketones to different experimental preparations, neurons could maintain their membrane potential, even in the pr presence of a chemical uh, stressor, uh, you know, altering going hypoxia or hyperoxia, uh, you know, different scenarios, the, the ketones would enhance mitochondrial function. And we had mitochondrial membrane dyes. And we are also measuring mitochondrial superoxide anion. And we we're using a, a technique called dihydroethidium to do that. And I developed a technique that I published in hippocampal brain slices, where the dye could be given continuously. So you could do longer experiments on this and it published it like in 2008. And then it was sort of th that technique. Uh, I used that technique and then I started applying ketones to different experimental preparations and saw that the membrane potential mitochondrial function could be maintained under these extreme environments. So that gave me more motivation. Prior to that, I was looking at different uh, pharmaceutical compounds. I was also looking at different antioxidants, a superoxide uh, and catalase mimetic called uh, it's a big long name, uh, tin protoporphyrin. It's like a, 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 basically a molecule that would activate various heme proteins and then augment, you know, uh, and sop up the superoxide. But work, what worked better than anything else was enhancing mitochondrial function, which got to the root of the, the problem, which was superoxide to begin with. So if you're producing less superoxide, then you don't have to throw in all these antioxidants to neutralize them, right? So if you go right to the mitochondria and target energy production in the mitochondria and you bioenergetically enhance mitochondrial function, the mitochondria can make ATP and that ATP uh, maintains the sodium potassium ATPase pump which allows the neurons to maintain their membrane potential, which is the whole basis of life, right? Yes. So, uh, so that I, I saw that experimentally in a wide variety of cell-based systems, and we extended that to hippocampal, you know, experiments, and then to mice, and then to rats, and now then to humans, and clinical trials, and things like that. So it was the basic science really convinced me that something was going on. Uh, but basic science research does not always, it's very informative, but not always uh, predictive or translatable. But uh, there are many experiments we do in cancer models that do not translate to human therapies. But I'll have to say that the, the experimental models that are done in rodents with different drugs and with different therapies and seizure models have a high level of uh, translatability to humans. And, uh, and that was reassuring as we were moving things into the realm of humans. We're looking at membrane potential. Are there any practical or tangible ways this manifests in terms of what someone's experience of life might look like over the long term, longevity, disease, resiliency, etc.? Yeah, so translating that so our ability to maintain membrane potential, not only maintain a stable membrane potential, uh, I'll quickly add, as our membrane potential starts to depolarize, then the cell's ability to make neurotransmitters to basically do housekeeping functions, autophagy, things like that will decrease over time. So having, uh, you know, doing metabolic interventions and other interventions that can help to maintain the stability of the membrane potential will make the brain more resilient in the context of a stressor. So that's really what I study. And that has tremendous implications for longevity, uh, for DNA repair, for example, uh, the cell's ability to generate ATP, the bioenergetic state of the cell, is intimately linked to the fidelity of the nuclear genome, right? So if ATP levels drop, the DNA repair mechanisms will decrease over time and you'll, you'll accumulate more genetic defects and the ability to repair 
uh, single-stranded DNA NICs or mutations that happen in the DNA will be impaired. So those, those mutations will accumulate over time, and then that will drive the, the uh, aging process, if you will. And then couple that, if that decrease in DNA repair, in ATP levels, in uh, decrease in, in uh, membrane potential of the cell is happening in the context of a higher background of oxidative stress, meaning higher levels of reactive oxygen species, superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals. These things drive DNA damage, membrane lipid peroxidation, but they also result in higher levels of inflammation. And then it's that inflammation that could then feed back and actually cause more <laughs> oxidative stress. So reactive oxygen species are the precursor for more uh, inflammation in the brain. And I really do think that that's a discussion that and research that needs to happen more in the context of bipolar and depression and schizophrenia is looking at inflammatory markers, neuroinflammation, you know, imaging technologies that would do that. There's some imaging technologies, but a simple thing to do is to look at, you know, H high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And I have enough people emailing me, and I think the science is pretty solid that when that's elevated, uh, that, that correlates to mitochondrial dysfunction, insulin resistance, high oxidative stress. And these are things that typically are not measured, but they should be measured. So to, to summarize what you mentioned, the, you know, we have a condition, bipolar disorder, that where there's increased lactate in the blood. We've been doing this for a very long time. And then I was listening to your work about uh, looking at lactate in uh, divers, looking at neural membrane potential, looking at uh, alternative therapy to epilepsy. Meanwhile, me and many of my friends with bipolar are taking anti-epileptic drugs to try and treat the condition. And all of this made complete sense to me that this, uh, I mean, it didn't make complete sense to me at the time. I was still very much trying to figure it out, but I knew there was something in this because I felt like there's too many things that make sense to me here. And, and I'm constantly speaking to bipolar people that tell me that they're, you know, feel like they're drowning or they're on, they can't breathe. They, the physiological state of bipolar depression is so much more severe than anyone is, is aware of or has ever been written about in the literature. But when you sit with someone going through this uh, and you see what they're like they're like they have like kids and they can't play with them they can't move from their bed it's like you know that something is so much more physiologically worse than uh, you know it's, it's not a psychological symptom it's a physical uh, condition that happens so I, I was really excited to hear that you were um, working in this direction and and, and the thing you're testing was ketone esters and so Matt and I have both experimented with exogenous ketones what what do you think are the potential they, they have clear applications for these situations like oxygen deprivation what, what do you think is the potential of them for conditions like bipolar and, and neuropsychiatric conditions? Yeah, I, well, the research is ongoing, and uh, you know, and we do research on ketogenic diets and and exogenous ketones. And I, I don't think they need to be mutually exclusive. <laughs> like we talk about these things. Oh, if you don't do that, you just get on exogenous ketones. And and marketers of these things tend to push in that direction. Uh, I've always been an, an advocate of using exogenous ketones and not all formulations are the same as a means to further augment the therapeutic efficacy of a ketogenic diet, especially in the context of epilepsy, but I think also in the context of, of mental health disorders. Uh, and, you know, the, the military was very, was not very interested in a, in a high fat ketogenic diet for the warfighter. So what I, I changed the direction of my research protocol, which didn't get funded <laughs> into replacing ketogenic diet with exogenous ketones. And then I went on, I immersed myself into the chemistry and the science and talking with people. And we, we tested a number of different agents, but we tested an agent that had extremely high level of, of, uh, anti-seizure effects and, and some ketogenic agents did not, uh, but it was it was a particular an agent that elevated beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate in like a, a one to one ratio. So for specific applications like a navy dive, where it's like okay, you got thirty minutes, you have to get into you know fasting level ketosis, five millimolar prior to your mission, you know, and where you don't have time to get into a ketogenic diet and do the whole keto adaptation thing. I actually did not think that getting into this research, I, I was thinking you needed to adapt the body over time 
to be. But I had conversations with Dr. Richard Veach and, you know, George Cahill and they were like, well, that's why you fast. Even overnight, you start producing ketones in the brain. The, the transporters are always there. They don't need to be like upregulated. We always have monocarboxylic acid transporters. I mean, they're the same transporters for lactate. So the metabolic machinery is always there to make ketones and actually to transport and use them, you know, transport them across the blood brain barrier, the cell membrane and the mitochondrial membrane, like that's there. So the, if you just titrate the, the levels of ketones up in your blood, your brain will use them proportionally. So that, that, that was something I didn't fully understand, uh, until, you know, I had to talk to some of the, the real key people in the field in 2008 or nine. So, uh, so I'm, it's kind of a long winded thing, but I'm just kind of giving you information on how I got to this path. And so for specific applications, I think it makes sense to use exogenous ketones for people that are unwilling and unable to follow a ketogenic diet or for military applications for the astronaut exposed to a solar particle event or something like that to protect them against radiation. Cause there's like, you know, there's ways that they can protect the DNA and then the downstream effects would be like cancer and that. So uh, I think there's some applications there that I'm very, very interested in studying, but for the general population that are using ketogenic therapies to manage a metabolic disorder or a psychiatric disorder, I think ket exogenous ketones need to be used sparingly at first, and they, they should be, uh, you know, they should be an add-on to a well-formulated ketogenic diet as an add-on. Uh, so, so I think there's two benefits. One is I, I'm in favor of using a ketone electrolyte formulation, you know, uh, the product that uses keto start and it's got like a balance of sodium, potassium, magnesium, uh, calcium. And so you're giving electrolytes, which I think are very important. I've seen changes in electrolyte affect my mood. <laughs> so I can imagine for someone with a, a, a mental health issue that uh, significant alterations in electrolytes could significantly impact brain function and mood. So a ketone salt that delivers electrolytes and also elevates and sustains beta hydroxybutyrate, uh, and also helps to normalize and stabilize glycemia, uh, I think has a lot of applications and, and I, and I think it needs to be studied. Have you used so, um, number now? one? Uh, I take keto start every day. I take it every oh, day. Awesome. And I started, awesome. I started, went on a well-formulated ketogenic diet, you know, about two years ago now. And I started doing that measuring ketones and then added it, like you said, Dom, as a supplement as things were going well. Now I take it twice a day, you know, after the sauna, get the electrolytes. I feel great. But here's my question though. Do we know much about what happens differently in the body uh, as a result of taking exogenous ketones versus just making them yourself? Yeah. I, well, like I said, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And one thing that I've come to learn and appreciate is that when we elevate ketones in the blood, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. When you give a very large dose of a ketone ester, that can actually inhibit your own ketone production. So what happens is, and we had a poster on this at Metabolic Health Summit, and it, and it has to be a fairly large dose that gets you above two millimolar into the three range is that a large dose of ketone ester will cause an increase, uh, a, even a small increase in insulin. And that it, increase in insulin has an anti-lipolytic uh, effect. So it decreases mm -hmm. fat oxidation and fat oxidation in the liver is actually what produces ketones. But I have not seen that with the ketone salts, meaning that if you're in a state of mild ketosis or whatever, uh, and you're drinking ketone salts, it does not increase insulin. So you're, you're continuing to make, to make your ketones. So if you're on a high carb diet and you consume, uh, and this is a lot of, most of our rodent model studies, uh, are showing that when you administer exogenous ketones and then look at the blood, it looks very similar to someone who's on a ketogenic diet, which means like low insulin, very low glucose, glucose goes down probably because the neurons and the mitochondria are happy and they have enough energy. So counter-regulatory mechanisms will decrease the need 
uh, for glucose. So the liver will basically downregulate uh, the release of, uh, of glucose through gluconeogenesis, but also uh, glycogenolysis goes down. So there's some, uh, what we have not done is we've done metabolomics in the brain and in the blood, but we have not yet done an in-depth metabolomics on the liver. So I think what's happening when you consume exogenous ketones, it's altering the physiology of the liver in a way that alters metabolic substrate utilization that you can measure in the muscle and in the blood and even in the brain that looks similar and, and mimics the ketogenic diet. So in that way, it is not negating, uh, you know, the effects of the ketogenic diet, but it, there's many, many processes that are happening at the same time. The thing that's not happening if you give exogenous ketones with the standard diet is, um, you know, fat oxidation, although there's a study by Brianna Stubbs and uh, another group showing higher fat oxidation in the muscle, and I think independent of a ketogenic diet. But I would say with a ketogenic diet, you have a high degree of insulin suppression that's transitioning the body more towards higher fat oxidation. And then you have to have a higher capacity to transport that fat. Uh, which actually may be, it's a controversial subject, which may be leading to higher levels of LDL and ApoB even because the, uh, if David Feldman is right, the, 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 the energy model of the lean mass hyper responder would necessitate a higher transport capacity, uh, lipoprotein transport capacity to do that. And I actually run pretty high LDL and even ApoB uh, you know, it's on the edge of, of being high. So I, you know, and, and that could, that could, that observation with the ketogenic diet has resulted in probably the most pushback against the ketogenic diet is that it's altering triglycerides. I'm looking at blood work now from a parent that has a child with a metabolic disorder and the ApoB is very high and the triglycerides are very high. It's like, you know, in the two, two to 300 range triglyceride because they have a metabolic disorder. So, you know, their question to me is that, should we transition the child to a more of a Mediterranean diet and then give him exogenous ketones? And, you know, I, I can't make these kind of recommendations, but I think the science, if someone is following a ketogenic diet and it's having a, a, a very profound approach, uh, a profound effect at helping them manage uh, their mental health, uh, getting off of the diet onto exogenous ketones, I don't think is the answer, but a transition or going from a strict ketogenic diet where you're hitting like two millimolar all the time on the ketogenic diet and going to more of a low carb Mediterranean diet where your ketones may drop to 0.5 or like 0.8 or something like that. But then you bring your ketone levels back up by putting an add on exogenous ketone. And, and then that could help normalize blood lipids. Because when I first got into this research, the LDL thing I thought was like, you know, something that was happening in 10% of people, but it seems mm -hmm. like it's more like 50% of people. So my personal approach is actually to, I, I was following a strict ketogenic diet for a long time and saw some pretty high numbers with my LDL. I've transitioned more to a lower, a low carb, very low carb Mediterranean diet. Uh, where I have some fruit in with that and maybe some, uh, you know, uh, I have, have carbs maybe in the, like the hundred gram range and, and maybe even 150 gram range. And that's, you know, bringing my LDL down, uh, but I could still maintain ketosis with exogenous ketones. And I think that could be an important approach. It needs to be studied though. You know, it's quite a difference going on keto started didn't you might, <clears throat> with your mood stabilization, you're saying it helped a lot in keeping things, um, when you first start taking keto start uh, the keto salts you know it's quite a difference is it uh, you know i don't know because already my i have this weird theory that i more or less like cured myself with those first nine months of being of having my ketones above 2.0 1.5 2.0 and it's weird and and maybe it has something to do with you know a, a 
uh, prevention or uh, again uh, against hypomania mania but i've been able to sink my ketones down to 0.3 or 0.4 but then with the keto start on top of that and do just fine and i haven't had because i haven't noticed any hypomania or significant mood elevation in a long time now it's hard to tell but i've been feeling great. I take them once in the morning at around eight and I take them in the afternoon at about four, one packet. And yeah, I'm sure it gives me a little bit of a buffer, but I still don't eat any carbs in bulk. So the only carbs that come are in small portions and salad dressings and stuff like that. So, hey, Matt, <clears throat> I have got some questions for you guys. Uh, do you consume any uh, like vegetables or fruit or like wild blueberries or salads or, or things like that. I'm curious if your carbohydrate yeah. content comes from Veg that. And fruits, very rarely vegetables. Yes. But oh. in more or less moderation. Okay. And your total carb count for the day would be how much? I think it's got to be under 50 or 60 most days. Okay. Yeah. So as some days I'm that low, but like, uh, I've been into pumpkin lately. I get this canned pumpkin and it's like a great source of fiber has no impact on my glucose really. And I mix like stevia, dark chocolate and cinnamon in it. And then I put some, uh, some coconut cream and I mix it up. And that's like, that's been, uh, and I add a little bit of protein powder in the form of, uh, collagen like chocolate collagen or something like that and i've been snacking on that every day and that that has been it's carbohydrates and according to that it's up to like 30 to 50 grams of extra carbs per day but it's not impacting anything that i see on my continuous glucose monitor which i think is another conversation we could have uh i've not yet yet used a continuous ketone <clears throat> monitor but hope to do so soon but would like to do that but my morning ketones are about the same has hasn't changed if I add some are, fibrous carbs in, how are you finding the, um, CGM? Cause I haven't gotten one yet, but I've heard a lot about them. Yeah, I have one now, uh, Dexcom, uh, which is, which is great. My, my, my wife is annoyed by it because it beeps a lot. Uh, I, we have dinner, which is usually steak, fish or chicken, and then like a salad, maybe a little bit of broccoli or something like that. And then I, I usually have like about four ounces of red wine or something. And that tends to knock my glucose down a lot. And then we go for a walk after dinner and it's always triggered and it's always goes down into like the 50 range. And, uh, so I tend to run hypoglycemic in the evenings. Uh, and it's, it's very, um, uh, you know, on a ketogenic diet, it's very, not very interesting because it's pretty much a flat line. And that's where I think continuous glucose monitors are a super valuable tool that practitioners can have their patients on this. And then the data can go to a cloud uh, and they could see, they can monitor, they could have 10 patients and basically look at all their CGM responses and, and determine whether they're following the ketogenic diet or not, or if they fell off the wagon. So that's super valuable. And it doesn't even have to be a continuous ketone monitor. Uh, a CGM will essentially be like a flat line with very small bumps. If someone's following a well-formulated ketogenic diet, it's not going to change. So I, th I think this technology needs to be, uh, needs to be leveraged for practitioners uh, in the world of epilepsy. And I've talked about this at like American Epilepsy Conference, but I think it needs to be used uh, in, in the mental health world too. If you have ketogenic practitioners that are treating patients, may actually be more valuable because the eating disorders, there may be some relationships with food there that may be a little bit harder to manage in the adult population. Whereas kids, they just eat what their parents prepare for them, right? For, for the most part, unless they're breaking into the cupboard or something like that. But This is fascinating. Have you noticed yeah. any d weird variables in your life that affect your glucose, like acute stress or yeah, that's actually, it's good that you mentioned that, uh, COVID when I got COVID, uh, I saw like, uh, a spike up and then a spike down. Um, uh, and I, when I do the sauna, uh, but I, I think there's an enzymatic reaction that happens in the glucose sensor. And I think high temperature I do, uh, I don't do sauna, but I do a hot tub 
at our house and I, I crank it up to 104 and I put a thermometer under my tongue and I, I wait till my temperature gets up to 102 and then I maintain that for 10 minutes and that's my that's my heat therapy and I think I I'm more comfortable not super heat, heating my head in a sauna I'm more comfortable being in a hot tub where my head's outside but my core temperature gets up and I think that's where you get all the benefits of sauna and I think that's another conversation that you guys could have because I think there's very real world benefits in mental health to sauna and then I have a cow trough <laughs> that I brought near my near my uh, hot tub and I I uh, take two five gallon buckets and I freeze them in my freezer and I dump the five gallon blocks into that. And I jump into that and I do hot tub and then cold plunge and then hot tub. And then that's my morning routine pretty much every day that I'm home. And I think that does wonders for mental health and, and sleep. So my sleep, my deep sleep is always has improved since I've been doing that. And sleep is also tied, tied to mental health. Uh, but okay. So when I jump into cold, it goes down to 40, my CGM. And when I'm in the, the hot yeah. tub, it'll go up to like 120. Uh, so I think the, se the sensor is meant to essentially function within the temperature of your body. Right. So, so I think changing the ambient, uh, being submerged in water, cold water will affect it or hot water. Could you talk a little more about how of uh, heat therapy can improve mental health and maybe practical ways that people could implement this into their lives? Yeah. Uh, good question. I think, you know, just, I think at the simplest level, when you exercise vigorously, you can elevate your core temperature up to like one Oh, you know, one Oh one, one Oh two, you know, I've seen this in myself, but if you're exercising, for example, and even a brisk walk in, you know, the Florida heat, you could be up to 104 and sustain that. So that, that is in a way heat therapy. And then you're probably synergistically augmenting that therapy with exercise, right? So exercise is one form of, of heat therapy. Not everybody has a sauna, you know, I, I don't have a sauna, but uh, I had, had an old hot tub at my house. And when we were renovating, I bought a heat pump and got it operational with some plumbing stuff. So, but I, I tweaked it. So it gets a little bit hotter than normal. So I think uh, one could elevate their core temperature by taking a hot shower. Uh, you could do it in a hot tub. You could do it in a sauna. Uh, you could do it just laying out in the sun. Your core temperature can go up. There is tremendous literature on this that was brought to my attention through uh, Rhonda Patrick. Uh, I visited her house. She showed me her sauna and it got me going into the literature. Peter Atia has done a deep dive on this, on brain health and, and sauna. The data is very solid, uh, mostly in the context of Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, mood, depression and things like that. I don't think they specifically looked at, uh, at bipolar, but it's activating heat shock proteins. I actually did my PhD on heme oxygenase, heme oxygenase uh, two, which is the constitutive form and heme oxygenase one. But there's a variety of heat shock proteins that are activated that not only upregulate our defense mechanisms, but uh, can activate uh, other uh, factors in the brain that associated with uh, you know, neurotransmitter systems like dopamine levels will go up, maybe serotonin. But I think the big thing is like brain blood flow goes up. I noticed, uh, you know, when I, you know, if I'm under the influence of, of certain drugs, uh, I don't, I don't use too many recreational drugs or anything, but, uh, but say if I have a little bit of alcohol and I go, it just like hits you hard because it's increasing circulation to the brain. So uh, I think there's something like a 30% increase in circulation to the brain and cerebral blood flow. So that alone could be impacting plus all the different physiological uh, factors that are associated with heat stress, you know, these heat shock proteins. And I think the science is very nascent on understanding it. The science is very mature in regards to uh, characterizing the benefits, but the science is still kind of nascent in regards to mechanistically understanding the mental health benefits of heat therapy, but I'm a believer in it. And I've been doing this, you know, not too long, maybe for about a year, pretty consistently. So just, you mentioned <clears throat> the effects on SCGM readings and that these could be used in mental health. And I, I think it was on Tim Ferriss, you'd mentioned once using CGM 
um, a few years ago, and I, I actually went and got one of the Abbott ones. I think at the time they were a bit confused because it was only diabetics using them, and I was trying to yeah. explain that I have a mental health condition. I'd like to use a CGM, and I've, I managed to get one. And I did this experiment for a year where I did um, I, I didn't do CGM for the full year, but for about uh, three months of it, I did CGM, and then I did just normal glucose and ketone readings uh, throughout the rest of the year. And I, and I noticed something which um, I'd love to share, but I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if it's of use or interesting. But I, I noticed that um, GKI was the most strongly correlated with mood stabilization. So it wasn't um, yeah. for me just glucose or ketones alone, but the GKI was much more strongly correlated um, with mood stabilization over a year of measuring. And I found that really interesting because I just expected to see as the ketones go up, the moon stabilization goes up. And it definitely wasn't that. It was the glucose coming up, uh, glucose coming down into a good range and the ketones being in a good range. Yeah. So I found that, um, and I know that there's been similar observations with like what you've done in cancer research, that GKI is important. Um, so I have so many questions about this, but um, I'm trying to pick the most, I want to be respectful of your time because I know we're at six o'clock. Um, but the, the most interesting one I'm to good me on is, my end. So okay. have you, how yeah. long have you I'm got glad you that? brought this up too, because I think it's an important topic. Yeah. And I think if there's one biomarker, it's the GKI, I, I think is a fantastic biomarker. And the, the Keto Mojo device will even do that for you, which is pretty cool. How, how long do you have? This is like my favorite podcast so far. Yeah, so yeah I'm good for have... another hour. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, awesome. It's going to leave me oh, time oh. to grill Dom on keto bodybuilding <laughs> for about 150 yeah, we'll minutes. The, after. We'll get into the, um, yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, could you, yeah, could you, could you share maybe some of what you've learned in cancer that might give it, so say this was representative, like my uh, N equals one um had some transferability could you what could you share from your cancer research and measuring gki that might indicate why this is important um for mental health as well as for physical health yeah sure well uh professor thomas seyfried uh brought this to my attention he might be someone you might want to have on uh i mean he did some seminal work in epilepsy and uh and ketogenic therapies uh and noted made made comments to me when I first connected with him in cancer that for epilepsy, he also thought that the GKI was, was very important and should get more attention. So uh, glucose and ketones typically have an inverse relationship. So the higher your ketone levels get, glucose will go down to a certain degree, but there's very uh, powerful homeostatic mechanisms that maintain uh, blood glucose, right? So they only go down to a certain level uh, even with prolonged fasting, maybe two millimolar, three millimolar, but uh, but they they the glucose ketone index, which is the level of glucose over the level of ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate in millimolar concentration, and so one a glucose ketone index of one would be analogous, for example, to uh, a glucose level of three point five and a ketone level of three point five. You know that. The lower the glucose ketone index, the lower the level of, uh, of insulin, uh, IGF-1, mTOR, many of the, the PI3 kinase pathway has significant suppression. If you can achieve and maintain a glucose ketone index of say one, which is pretty hard to do, a lot easier to do with exogenous ketones. Uh, if you can maintain it between like one and even four, which would be, you know, a glucose of four and a ketone level of one, uh, I think has pr pretty profound anti-seizure effects and anti-cancer effects. And I think would be a good biomarker if, you know, it's, it's a multi-biomarker, but a single number I, I think would be uh, effective when applied to metabolic psychiatry. And I think not everybody, my understanding is not everybody needs to be in a state of ketosis to manage probably more effective for managing the manic like bipolar one manic phase but um but it's it's my it's my opinion that you know the glucose ketone index maintaining it within one to four is also indicative of eating behavior and also indicative of the individual making the time and effort to kind of formulate the diet, you know, plan for the diet. If they're, if they're popping out of that range quite, quite, uh, frequently, that means they typically, something could be happening physiologically. They could be under stress, which is stress can impact, can decrease your ketones and elevate glucose. But generally speaking, the tighter the GKI, 
uh, the better adherence they're having to the diet and, and they're following through with, with making the meals and eating, you know, properly. So, uh, so I, I, I think that's, that's a key insight that you had with the glucose ketone index. And I think it's an important insight that us researchers need to incorporate into our research. So you suspect <laughs> in metabolic psychiatry, this could be a better metric than just looking at ketone levels per se? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, you know, if you have someone that's, uh, say if you have someone on a particular drug that's elevating glucose, but their ketones are elevated, uh, then they could be negating some of the effects of the therapeutic ketosis by elevating, by, by the elevated glucose, which could be, you know, atypical antipsychotic drugs, maybe a corticosteroid or something like that, uh, could be impacting glucose in a negative way that would not be captured, you know, that uh, you're capturing that data with the glucose ketone index. And I think that's important. It gives more granularity into, uh, into, as, as a biomarker it's into super, metabolism. It's super interesting that you mentioned that GKI might reflect more accurately effects on mTOR and PA3 kinase and things like this, because um, one of the things I got really interested in was I was speaking to a lot of people with uh, PCOS that have bipolar and bipolar is quite highly comorbid with uh, PCOS and they're, they're, you yep. know, PCOS is essentially, is it, would it be accurate to say PCOS is a condition of insulin resistance? I suppose um, certainly yep. is majorly involved in that in yep. uh, the pathophysiology of it. So I was speaking to a bunch of um, people who have PCOS and they're bipolar. And I noticed they were, um, this was on an online forum and I was, I noticed they're talking about using ketogenic diet. And so that was, really, um, so I was interested in that, but then also they were saying that their mood was stabilizing when they were going on ketogenic diet and they were doing it just for PCOS, nothing to do with bipolar. It was just for their PCOS. Um, but what was really interesting was they were saying they were also using inositol supplementation and they were finding this increases the benefit of ketogenic diet. And so I, I started speaking to them about this and I was like, what, why do you use inositol? What's the connection here? And I started reading up on, you know, why inositol is used in PCOS and it's for, um, you know, the kind of theories that it increases insulin signaling. Um, and then it got me thinking about bipolar treatment because we've, Matt's been on lithium. I've never taken it personally. It was obviously very common for bipolar. I'm coming yeah. off. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm down to, I'm down to, um, I'm down to uh, 750 daily, half of what I was on a few months ago, but continue. Congratulations. Yeah, it's, 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 and it's such a paradoxical medication because it's so helpful in the short term, but it really damages you in the yeah. long term. So, um, so an idea I'd love to run past you is that the, um, in bipolar, the two kind of major targets of lithium are the PI cycle, the phosphatidylinositol cycle, and yeah. GSK3. And there's been like 50, 60 years of research on this. And this, got, this made me think that this phosphatidylinositol cycle is so central to bipolar uh, treatment and, you know, drug companies are trying to target it and lithium uh, targets it. And I wondered whether um, this is because it's affecting insulin signaling. So I put this paper uh, proposing that, that lithium is having this effect on insulin signaling. And then I, I noticed that this was actually something people talked about really early on with bipolar. They used to basically take us and put us in wards and put us on insulin shock therapy, where they yep. would basically put you into an insulin induced coma, which is just, you know, you were, you were saying like how some people with epilepsy get given brain surgery before they're offered a diet. And I think some of these treatments are just like uh, impossible to imagine what it'd be like for your family experiencing people going through this anyway. So the, the very um, severe treatments, but they did make people better in the short term by just flooding the system with insulin. And um, so I, I just, I think that there was a metabolic narrative about our treatments that's kind of been stolen away from us by what happened over the last 50 years with kind of um, drug research, essentially, where if you look at the earliest papers on lithium, they were saying that this has an insulin-like effect. You know, the very first paper on GSK3 inhibition in insulin said this has an insulin-like effect in the body. And it was kind of a given that this was having a metabolic effect. It restores like insulin sensitivity in mice, whole body insulin sensitivity. And there's no paper showing it increases hippocampal glucose metabolism. So I, I wonder whether like we've kind of, uh, we, there were some indications of this quite early on and we just went off on this kind of neurotransmission trajectory of, of research and lost sight of the metabolic effects. D do you think that this has happened in multiple conditions where there was originally some metabolic understanding of these treatments and we kind of went off on a tangent with specific like, you know, receptors and, 
Uh, what's your what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, it's a super interesting uh, hypothesis uh, to explore. And yeah, I have your paper, and I think it's very insightful, like what you have uncovered in a very novel way, uh, and, and having an appreciation for the lithium induced augmentation of insulin sensitivity potentially impacting uh, neurotransmitter balance, but just, you know, general brain activity. Um, so one question is if for people that start lithium and initiate lithium, then if there's an insulin sensitivity uh, is coming into play, what happens to, has anyone measured, you know, their blood glucose in response? It'd be interesting to have a uh, CGM and also to just measure their, their fasting insulin and seeing how that changes in response to lithium therapy. Yeah, the, so there's there's animal studies with mice where they've shown that it, it, it restores, and sort of course you're aware of them that the studies, um, you know, whole body insulin sensitivity, and in yep. humans there's it's not really it, from what I can tell it's not really clear. Some people report hypoglycemia on lithium, but it's yeah. not there's no kind of like large data on it. Um, so it would be really the, the the one of the most exciting ones I found recently was the study by Gur Delhi who was showing sorry completely uh, butchered that pronunciation but he um apologies but the he was showing that in the hippocampus glucose metabolism increased quite significantly when he gave lithium which is really interesting because why would that happen you know it's it's it doesn't yeah. seem like something that's ever been considered for um lithium um, I, I, I thought about the, i was reading your paper i remember reading it i have it printed at home but uh i was thinking that it'd be interesting to measure just you know blood levels of, of insulin too and um if it's potentially affecting the beta cells in the pancreas. Mm. And, uh, and I think that could be by, uh, by augmenting insulin signaling, PI3 kinase, GS, GS, GSK, uh, that it could be altering metabolic physiology in a way that's not only increasing insulin signaling, but maybe contributing to uh, the pancreatic release of insulin. Guys, I wonder if I could get a CGM and then if I drop my next 150 milligrams of lithium, see if anything changes just as an individual case study. That would be pretty fun. That'd be really interesting. Yeah, we should, we could, we're doing some science here. That would be we got a little, yeah, stuff. I could be like a little do, test uh, mouse. We could, <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, that would be super interesting to know. Like I, and um, one of the things that's, um, you know, I feel like this was always at the early stages of bipolar research, like Amel, Kreplin wrote this description of bipolar. He's one of the first people to write a description of bipolar. And he wrote that in the patients, they become catatonic and have completely depleted energy. And then they yeah. become so energetic that they, you know, are up all night moving around. And it's like in the earliest parts of bipolar um, kind of research, I feel like this metabolic aspect was implicit in it. And it got kind of stolen from us by people trying to, uh, well, you know, it got stolen from us by certain um treatments that were um you know priorities for research at the time so yeah. I, i'd love to see this like become a topic again and i think that some of the um uh, the, you know the work that you have shown with how this affects the brain has been like really at the genesis of like this whole metabolic psychiatry field because you were saying eight years ago and as someone with bipolar who was uh, struggling with stay and that it resonated with me when you said that neuronal excitability and membrane potential are related to ketogenic uh, diet. It was the first time I kind of uh, thought there was this uh, connection. So um, I guess the, uh, one of the questions I'd love to ask is uh, you're talking about biomarkers and perhaps we can measure things like insulin, mm -hmm. insulin sensitivity. What, what biomarkers um, as, alongside GKI do you think could be promising for metabolic psychiatry and, and bipolar disorder in the future? Yeah, well, I think there's a bunch of them, right? And uh, we're doing work uh, funded in part by by the Bozucki Foundation. Very thankful for that. Uh, and that's spearheaded uh, here at the University of South Florida, but in collaboration with Dr. Allison Hall, where we're using continuous glucose monitors in patients that are non-diabetic, uh, they don't have a, a mental health problem, and uh, they're, they're non-obese, so just normal, healthy subjects. And uh, what was interesting is that uh, a couple of things kind of stand out is that mental health improves across the board uh, with a low carb diet, uh, bordering on ketogenic diet. Their ketones are about 0 0.8, uh, 0 .0 0 0.6 to 0 0.8. So it, it's carbohydrate restricted enough to produce a mild state of ketosis. 
And uh, in some of the tests that we administer to the subjects is the, the GAD-7 test, the PHQ-9. Uh, the, the Florida Medical Clinic, Allison Hall's team has a, has a general mood wellness test. They score considerably better on that and sleep. Uh, but some of the things that also stand out, and we have to do the correlation uh, statistics on this and measurements is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I'm, I'm kind of of the opinion that the health of your liver kind of sets, you know, a, a lot of our mental health because the liver is the master regulator of metabolism. And when that becomes de-energized with certain drugs like alcohol and other drugs, then uh, metabolic health is, you know, impaired uh, significantly. And, and I think you'll find a, a, a correlation there, but, uh, but I think the thing that we're looking at is glycemic variability, right? It does glycemic variability and we're analyzing the data now, but we, we had some problems with the continuous glucose monitors because like, you know, I have one on the back of my arm and if I roll over and sleep on my side, you get what's called a pressure low. So we we're getting subjects that were running like forties, their glucose levels were forties in the middle of the night. And essentially what this means is that we have to analyze all our data over again, go into like the individual data sets and, and cut out, you know, the artifacts, which are pressure lows. And sometimes my former PhD student has kids. And if he puts his child on a backpack and it's cutting off circulation to his arm, the CGM on his arm is not, it has impeded blood flow and he's getting a hypoglycemia like from that. And he mentioned like things like that we see. Uh, so the, in my mind, I think the most important biomarkers to track would be, uh, you know, insulin. Insulin is not part of the standard comprehensive metabolic panel. And I teach in the scholarly concentration of nutrition at the medical school. And I think it's, it's very important for educators listening to this to emphasize that we need to train our, our medical students <laughs> in nutrition. And, and actually I have quite a few of them working on mental health and nutrition too. So, um, so I think that like insulin needs to be part of a, a metabolic panel and there's as we become hyperinsulinemic, we have the ability to maintain our blood glucose within normal range, but only after it reaches a certain threshold does it kick in and we can become type two diabetic, right? When a fasting glucose of one over 126, right? So insulin would be key. Uh, I'm of the opinion that, you know, hemoglobin A1C is important too, but uh, that's an indirect measure. A more direct measure would be a continuous glucose monitor and looking at average glucose uh, and high sensitivity C-reactive protein. I think I was a little bit skeptical of this, you know, because it's like this general inflammatory marker. But I think in that way, it's high sensitivity <laughs> general marker. I have seen in myself and in others, and and and, and also now there's peer-reviewed publications that this general marker of systemic inflammation is a pretty good indicator of mental health and that when HSC is spiked and stays elevated, that that correlates with depression, anxiety, and other aspects. So uh, HSCRP is not part of standard blood work. So, so I think that should be kind of on the list too. Uh, but I think that when we go for a normal checkup and see our doctors, they don't really you know, probe us about our mental health. I think there should be some kind of questionnaires and things like that. I mean, there's blood-based biomarkers, blood pressure is super important too. I mean, it can't, you know, uh, that's an important one too, but uh, general blood work is, is very important, but I think there's also doctors should know about your sleep. And I think wearing a sleep monitor uh, so sleep is a really important biomarker. If you're not sleeping well, it's going to mess up other things. And there's a reason why you're not sleeping well. Right. Um, but, uh, but glucose ketone index, insulin, HSCRP and triglycerides are probably, and uric acid and hemoglobin A1C, you know, are, if I was to create like a suite of things and it would just be like those things and nothing else that would be, and most of the things that I mentioned are not even part of uh, standard 
uh, and this is this is across the board, not just for mental health, but just in general as a snapshot of your metabolic health. I think these things are super important. Well, Dom, I have no idea if you've looked at this, but just as kind of a shot in the dark, I heard Huberman mention on his podcast that getting direct sunlight in the first 30 minutes of the day in your eyes has an effect on metabolism and mood. Have you looked at that at all? Or can you hypothesize about why that might be the case? Yeah, well, I think we have photoreceptors, you know, on the back of the retina, and that stimulates, you know, via the optic nerve, uh, the center of the brain that basically sets the clock in our circadian rhythm, our diurnal rhythms, right? So uh, the liver has like a sensor too, like when you when you drink a cup of coffee, that kind of gets the clock started, right? But light is probably the most powerful circadian sync. And it doesn't have to be direct sunlight. I mean, you could have an artificial light that produces a wavelength analogous to sunlight too. Um, that can help. But yeah, I, I do think there's a lot. I, you know, I, I just I, mentioned I, this because for the people watching, yeah. this has literally changed revolutionize my my mood was already good yeah. but waking up at 7 30 getting outside and getting the sun in my eyes mm-hmm. every day no matter when i went to sleep so even if you go to bed a little later but you still get up yeah. and you get the sunlight and then you go back to bed this has done something yeah. tremendous for my mood the last two months since i've been doing it consistently <clears throat> like every day at 7 30 and so i just wonder what's happening here and i would love you know we i, I guess we don't have too much research about it, but what exactly the effect is that it's having? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. There's a lot of people study circadian biology uh, and a lot of shift workers suffer tremendously. People in confined habitats like submarines, uh, you know, you know. now NASA's really putting a lot of time and effort into synchronizing the light on, you know, the, the space station and other controlled habitats to synchronize with the sun to get circadian uh, in sync. And when you have, uh, I I guess the important thing to note (laughs) is that when you have circadian disruption, you have metabolic derangement. So the low hanging fruit would be to wake up, you know, what I do first thing is just, you know, I wake up, I drink a glass of water and then I let the dogs out and I go walk barefoot to basically let the cows out in the pasture. They just walk around our property uh, and I have to walk east directly into the sun. And, and I think that has done wonders, you know, moving to a farm a few years ago has done wonders for my mental health and being close to nature too. So, um, so I do think, you know, getting that morning sunlight too, and, and we can't, uh, you know, the, the benefits of just being out in nature are tremendous too. And then uh, Susan Massino, who is part of the metabolic mind think tank, uh, that the, the group that we had in, in Santa Barbara talked about, you know, at Metabolic Health Summit, she too, she talked about just being out in nature and that we are not wired to be sitting at a desk working. Uh, our brain does not, you know, our, our, our brain is much more comfortable and synchronized and, and de-stressed when it's actually perceived, perceiving the natural environment. That could be like a vista, it could be, uh, it could be a desert, it could be uh, a rainforest, but just being in nature and having a natural surrounding has profound effects on the brain. And that's also being exposed to natural light. And I think what you observe, Matt, is that morning light uh, is just super important. It just could be looking out the window, you know, and just observing nature and, and just the natural way. I think there's very much something to understanding the different wavelengths of light. And there's probably a way to harness that where we can optimize our, our office environments, our homes to better synchronize ourselves to the natural environment because we live in such an artificial environment, right? <laughs> So uh, I think we got to do what we can to get that morning sunlight, which is a simple trick, hack, if you want to call it that. that and the illness, bipolar is so intrinsically linked to the circadian rhythm cycle. And I know how many people, especially with type one bipolar, get that 
hypomania or even mania in March when the days are getting longer during the yeah. equinox. I know I suffered yeah. for that yeah. from that for years. And, you know, as I'm coming off lithium and taking away some of these medications, I'm planning on doing a hardcore, well-formulated ketogenic diet in March, maybe get a continuous glucose monitor, watch things very carefully and see if I can coast through that month, you know, asymptomatic as a result of really watching the diet and getting sunlight in the morning and wearing the blue light blockers in the evening. You know, they did a study, blue light blocking, blue light blockers are very powerful anti-manic, you know, wearing those in the evening instead of watching TV late at night. Um, yeah. So there's guys at home, there are a lot of other things you can do about this illness to manage it besides just the medication, you know, exercise, especially in the morning. I loved for a while I was doing the, um, before they started draining our pool, I was doing the freezing pool in the morning <laughs> at seven 30. Yeah. So I'd wake up the pools, like low fifties. I'd get in the pool for 10 minutes and man, that'll just get your, get your body temperature up in the morning. as so it can yeah. get, tell your system, okay, it's morning, raise the body temperature. And then in the evening, it'll cool down again. Your catecholamines. Yeah. Get massively activated with that. I, I hate being cold and wet. So, uh, but I know I, I do, I tend to do it at night. I do the, the heat and then I jump into the, uh, the cold, like at night I do it at night. It still makes me sleep really well, but I got into that pattern of jumping into the cold pool. Like in, we're in Florida here and it was in the forties this morning. So, uh, I need to start doing the, the ice bath in the morning to wake me up, but, uh, I do get outside. And I think the most important thing to do is just to, yeah, get exposed to that natural, uh, you know, sunrise, especially, uh, and, you know, whatever, if there's something to it being grounded, walking barefoot and feeling that tactile effect, you know, on your feet, you know, in the, in the, in the wet, <laughs> in the wet dewy grass, I think does, a, a lot for mental health too. Uh, but I, I, we are big believers in our household of just being in and around nature, which also means animals. So, I mean, we have cows on our property, we have dogs and things like that. And I think if someone, I, I heard someone describe the best hack for mental health as a pet, because it keeps you on a routine. It makes yeah. you, I have to walk the dogs like every day. So it gets you on an exercise program. Also the microbiome tends to be optimal. Mm -hmm. If you have a pet, our dog is always eating cow patties. <laughs> yeah. And just like, you know, it's, it's just, uh, and they, they just hang with us and they're just kind of all over us. So I, I think we are enhancing our immune systems and our mental health by having pets. So that would be another hack to add to the list. All right, guys, but don't get a snake. I have a snake. He does nothing. <laughs> Just, look at that bur my Burmese python, he's going to be 10 feet when he's fully grown. But he doesn't keep my, he doesn't keep my, um, anything about my life um, organized or systematic. He just lays there. Yeah. He's able to get a dog one to... of these days. You have to feed him so there's some pattern yeah. to yeah. to caretaking and i think Every also days, just yeah. like the mental act of caretaking for something uh for ours our dogs or whatever i eat so generally you know i'll have six eggs but i, I have two yolks i give the dogs each two yolks and then uh i'll have some like fatty steak or something on that they eat whatever we're eating they eat so their dogs are eating keto too. So it's like preparing. There are we don't have kids, so so they are essentially our ki our kids. And uh, and I think you know caretaking for pets and just uh, being social, like I think, is super important. Uh, did a podcast with Tommy Wood recently, and we talked about all the things for mental health. And I think my wife is very big on dancing, right? Because not I mean that's actually gets me out of my comfort zone, but that could be a good thing. And I think for mental health we need to routine is very good, but it's only when we get out of our comfort zone and challenge ourselves. Uh, for me, it would be dancing because you have the physical component, physical exercise, you have the mental component because you have to learn the steps, but then there's all the social component too, which could be stressful, right? But typically like, you know, when you learn these things, there's uh, a, a very positive social aspect to that. So that's a synergistic combination of physical, cognitive and social. And I think we need to appreciate different activities like that uh, for mental health. And I think that's a valuable component, you know, not just diet, not just 
you know, drugs and the medical institution, you know, establishment, but it needs to be a uh, lifestyle factors and not everybody's going to respond. Well, my, my wife hates to lift weights, you know, but for me, that was, that was my drug when I was in grad school, like exercise and lifting weights. That was my therapy. I, I don't, I think I would have had a, I, well, I did have a mental breakdown at cer certain points, but I think lifting weights kept me stable throughout grad school. And I, I think I would have like really crumbled if I didn't have that crutch. It was almost like a crutch for me. So you experienced um, weightlifting as something beneficial for your mental health in, during college. Yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine not doing it. Right. I mean, cause when you're in the lab working all day, running experiments, especially patch clamp electrophysiology, which is incredibly frustrating at times, I was like a caged animal. And I remember I did my PhD in a university hospital and uh, the gym was right across, I was at Rutgers University right across the street. And I would just take a break, work out and just like be completely distressed. And I would have so much productivity when I came back, you know, I'd get back into the lab and start doing recordings again and collecting data. It was just like a completely different mindset after working out. And I think that's so important, you know, and not everybody, I, I think we set this at an early age for me, like I associate lifting weights with like, you know, I start drinking my cup of coffee and feeling the caffeine and getting wired and like the anticipation. And it's just, I associate lifting weights with being euphoric. And it's just something I started doing when I was a teenager. And when you tell someone who has an exercise all their life to, to just start an exercise regimen, it's, it's intimidating to them. And it's becomes, you know, a, a painful thing at first, but it's like anything else. Once you start doing it and get better at it, then you start deriving more benefits and you start enjoying it. You get that dopamine spike when you start doing it. It's interesting what you're saying. <clears throat> it's interesting what you're saying about cold exposure like i live in scotland and all, all we are is like cold and wet all year round it's just like oh, yeah. it's, our, it's our life and but it's even now people are finding ways to be yet colder by going they're going up to the highlands uh, they started this during lockdown and there's yeah. like whole groups of people that do this and they take uh, axes and they cut holes in the ice and the locks and they go and dip yep. in them nice. and, they, and, they say, and, and the main thing they say is like i feel so good after doing this i feel so much less anxious so much more um you know happy like productive it's become like a whole movement there's a thing called the cold water club where guys from council estates in glasgow uh, go, uh sorry it's called the polar bear club and they go up to these like crazily cold locks uh, covered in ice in the middle of the highlands and they'll uh, take axes and dig holes and they hang out there for like a few hours it's quite amazing uh, wow. yeah, but i've been doing this awesome. for years man it's like one of my favorite things i was doing it even before i went on keto i used to go get a hundred pounds of ice, dump it in a bathtub, fill that thing up and then go in. And I would go bathtub, hot tub, freezing bathtub. I've done like Lake Tahoe in the winter. I've done, mm -hmm. it's well, honestly, there's something about it. And you get yeah. out after five, seven minutes. And it's like you're the entire, your entire nervous system has just been shocked. Yeah. It's amazing. Five to seven minutes. Wow. That, that yeah, is I've impressive. Gone, I've gone I'm five to seven. I'm working my way like there. Like yeah. two and a half. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's impressive, Matt. Yeah. My buddies and I will, my buddies and I'll tell you, sorry, it's mental, bro. Temperature is mental. Mind over matter. <laughs> and we'll just go in. Yeah. Very I, awesome. I tell people <laughs> that, you know, I haven't, I've been doing this not as like a protocol or anything, but just, you know uh you know in the winter when it, things get kind of cold here and the water temperature gets down to 50 but uh but i know with the ice bath you're pushing it down to like you know mid 30s probably right well that's, and dom it's, it's what you're talking about the the comfort zone thing because no one yeah. most of all me no one wants to get in that ice bath you know you look at that freezing yeah. water no one wants to get it i don't want to get in that but then you do it and i think there's something about exercising that muscle of doing things you don't want to do, be it getting up in the morning, you know, getting on the Peloton, going for a walk, like a lot of these things, your body, your body wants to remain inert and getting up and doing something. It does, it does, it is a muscle more or less and working the muscle and building it. Yeah, and it translates absolutely. into a lot of translates into everything in your life, studying, not procrastinating, et cetera. Mm, you know? You know, so I think it's one of the, the easiest ways to build that. Yeah. Comfort is really the only thing you can't achieve if you're constantly seeking it. So the only way to get comfort is to experience uncomfort, you know, <laughs> discomfort, uh, and, and some degree of dysphoria, I think, because, you know, the whole yin yang thing, like, you know, it's like, you don't experience joy unless you go through pain, mental pain. So 
if we were always living in a euphoric state, then that's our baseline. And then, you know, that changes our baseline. So we're just, we can't even experience joy if we're in a, in a blissful state of comfort. Right. So I think it becomes, especially in our modern society, when we're just surrounded and essentially bathed in, in these creature comforts. Right. So I think it becomes even more important to push ourselves you know, out of our comfort zone to, to experience comfort and to have a healthy balance because that's how humans evolved. I mean, having that, and, and some of my favorite authors kind of write about this, you know, that the only way to experience comfort is, um, uh, is to, to experience discomfort. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote a good book yes. called The Problem of Problem Pain. Of pain. Yeah, it's that that's that resonated with me a while back. I think I I lost uh, someone at the time, uh, but uh, you know, but yeah, so it's, it's the same thing. I think it's going to apply to mental health, and people need to appreciate these things and not necessarily always be seeking comfort. I mean, there's a degree of comfort we want for our families and our loved ones, but it's also important to let them know that hey, you know, uh, you have to experience some discomfort to really appreciate and enjoy comfort. It's, it's funny you say about the problem of pain because I, I read that when I was going through like really bad uh, bipolar depressions and um, I love C.S. Lewis because like I think he must have gone through because I think he lost his wife didn't he like and uh, yeah. he, that was kind of what triggered the book and the descriptions he gave were like it's amazing like how much benefit he derived from those hor- terrible experiences and how much meaning he kind of pulled out of that and I, yeah. I feel like in, in bipolar there's so many times when you essentially like are so unwell that, you, that your quality of life is so low that you just cannot conceive of even like another week or another two weeks and you have to yep. try and like find some reason to keep going so a lot of people get like really into philosophy or and uh, that was what got, but i got interested in c.s lewis but i think could you say like more about that like is there um because it's something that's really pertinent to everyone with bipolar is like you have to find a reason to keep going because it's so difficult at points like what what kind of kept you going like during hard times in your life or, or what led you to read, read C.S. Lewis and then look for those answers? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I, uh, I think I really started seeking, I guess you could say like seeking higher uh, philosophical, you know, answers to, to sort of the, the existence of life and things like that in grad school. Uh, I did lose a, a friend to a car accident back in like the nineties and stuff. And it's just, uh, and then I lost my grandma to all around the same time. And that I was not very much, uh, I grew up in a Methodist household, but didn't really embrace the religion that much. Uh, but read a, read a number of different books. I think, you know, I'm trying to think finding Darwin's God, I think was one. And, and then I started, you know, on a path of, of reading a lot of different authors uh, in philosophy and also in religion and Christianity and kind of uh, the Christian philosophy, if you want to call it, that was uh, kind of resonated with me. And I had read uh, uh, the screw tape letters by, <laughs> by C.S. Lewis, but it was a little bit above my head, to be honest, but it was, it was very interesting philosophy, <laughs> you know, and then I, it, and then I reread it and it meant something different. And of course the, uh, you know, the, the new Testament, you know, you know, really resonated with me, uh, and the message there. Uh, and I think that really, uh, galvanized my faith and then, and also just putting, putting the philosophy, putting like Christian philosophy into practice and it becomes an experiential science, you know, uh, whether historically you can, uh, maybe I had a lot of doubt, but when you, uh, and it could be, you know, it doesn't have, it could be various, uh, philosophical or religious practices, but, uh, especially with Christianity for me, when, when you put it into practice, it became, became like an experiential science that it resonated true when you followed the various, uh, aspects of, of the, the philosophy of the religion. But I don't like to think of myself as a religious person, but more of a spiritual person. And I like to integrate a lot of different things into it. Uh, but, but I think, it doesn't really become true to you unless you do it, you follow through and then through your life experiences and uh, 
and, and what you experience when you're in your teens is nothing like it's much different than when you're in your late 20s and 30s and 40s when you experience more of life a lot of these things ring true whereas at an earlier age they otherwise would not ring true and, and i think that's an important for pe maybe younger people listening to this uh if you read certain books at a younger age, like, you know, the Bible's a living word, right? It's going to have a totally different meaning when you reread things. So a lot of my old books, I'll reread them and, and they have a different meaning to me now. It's, it's really, it's really inspiring what you just heard, because like, I think it really reflects in the work that you do in your research is it seems really purpose-driven and like you've gone through so many different areas of like cancer and ketogenic therapies and military and and but it seems like underlying that you have a real sense of purpose about your career so I find that I think that's very inspiring for people that are coming up and trying to be good scientists as well is like and if I can ask like what does the what does the pursuit of scientific truth mean to you um, as a researcher what what is the what, what drives you to look for these answers even in areas where you know when you were first talking about this like eight or nine years ago very few people were interested in ketones and ketosis and now this is like a huge area what what kind of like made you commit to that early on when when it wasn't like a big area of interest yeah i think the biggest thing is just to be able to do science that is translatable you know i mean and not you know i i feel like when i was younger i did science for the sake of science to get a publication on you know the mechanism of this enzyme or that enzyme but like how are people going to use that so uh I became much more passionate and literally immersed in the science by actually, you know, putting myself into a state of ketosis, whether that be prolonged fasting, the ketogenic diet, or experimenting with exogenous ketones that were just like experimental mo molecules back in the day. So being super passionate about a therapy that had a high level of translatability, not just for epilepsy, but as we were doing experiments in the lab, we realized that this had wide ranging implications for many other neurological disorders and even cancer. So I think it's, it's really uh, pursuing a path that you're very passionate about. And I kind of interview people. I've just been so blessed to have like an amazing amount of, of, PhD students and medical students and postdocs in the lab that are just very passionate about this too. And that's one way I kind of vet them out. It's like, they have to be kind of passionate. They just can't be, it actually has to be above like just an intellectual curiosity and a good academic standing. They have to have a true passion for making a contribution. And I think, um, so it's, you know, passion, complete immersion into the science and then collaboration. And then also what I instill like into the lab, the whole lab culture is uh, educational outreach. So we do basic science, we do clinical science, but we also started the Metabolic Health Summit <laughs> in 2000. Actually, then it was called the Metabolic uh, Therapeutics Conference at the University of South Florida. And it just like grew exponentially because uh, we realized that we could do all the science in the world, but if people are not uh made aware of this like we held uh you know it was like a small room at the embassy suites on the university campus but we had like eric kossoff from johns hopkins come uh, jeff volick came and we had like all these people that were just up and coming this is many years ago and there was people standing at the door that wanted to come in so we had to get like a bigger venue and then move it to california and then ultimately you know last year it ended up being in santa barbara and metabolic health uh, or the metabolic psychiatry, that's where I got this jacket, uh, you know, the satellite conference, which was held in tandem to that. So, uh, so yeah, completely just having a passion, immersing yourself, collaborating with other people. But I think what you guys are doing is so inspirational and courageous too, because you are immersed in the science and you've experienced this yourselves personally. And uh and I think you have an appreciation for uh, and understand the power of educational outreach. And the podcast form is just like an amazing form. Look at people like Joe Rogan or, you know, Tim Ferriss. I mean, they have such a huge reach. And I just noticed, I didn't know really who they were when I like jumped on their podcast, but the explosion of emails of people reaching out to me saying, hey, I listened to your podcast. I did this. And now you know, my child's epilepsy is controlled or like I'm managing this disorder or that disorder. So it may be 
really realize that as academic scientists doing things that are translatable, we need to get, even if we're uncomfortable being in the public eye, we need to get onto a platform to disseminate the information. And I think that's super important. Thank you, Dom. One last question from me. Is it true you did a big lift after a prolonged fast? Yeah. <laughs> I heard something about that. Yeah. I, it's I like think, a legendary story. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I did not, uh, out of the gate, my first podcast with Tim Ferriss, he had, he sprung this question on me and I had no uh, knowledge that he knew about it, but I think Peter Atia, I was talking with him or maybe about this or somehow it got to him and Peter told, told Tim Ferriss. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I did fast for like seven days. And at the end of the fast, uh, I was super into working out at the time. This goes back well more than 10 years ago, I think. I deadlifted 500 pounds for uh, 10 reps. And I I try to uh, always keep that benchmark in my mind because I think deadlifts are super important for just keeping your strength and your muscle mass. But uh, I think it's important to have goals, but yeah, I, it validated to me that you could fast and that your, your strength, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, doing an endurance event in that fasted state, your energy levels are going to be lower than normal. But as far as strength, uh, I was pretty surprised by myself. <laughs> I was able to do it. Uh, and yeah, uh, I, I did that and I, I don't fast that often. Now I might do it quarterly. I'll do like a three day fast uh, a couple times a year. And I do think there are a lot of benefits uh, to doing that, but I haven't done a seven day fast in, in quite some time, but I think it's more of like a mental exercise, right? It puts you out of your comfort zone, but interestingly, after about three or four days, you fall into a very peaceful comfort zone <laughs> when you're without food. Um, it gets a little uncomfortable at times just because you, I enjoy eating food, but, uh, but I would encourage people out there listening to this, if they're you know, to, to experience fasting, they don't have to do seven days, but going two or three days without food is a good way to break down some mental barriers that you may have with your relationship with food. And some people may say, and for some people, it's definitely not if you've had an eating disorder or disordered eating, that this form of orthorexia could be problematic, you know, that this could cause a disordered eating pattern. If you fast and you like it so much, then you start doing it, it becomes like a Form it. But for the general population, I think there's a lot of benefits to fasting. Dude, I cannot imagine coming up, looking at five plates, no food in a week, freaking bars just laying there. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I didn't, I, it was a very short workout. I actually tend to, uh, I'm a very um, minimalist when it comes to working out. I warm up. And then I, I know I have the, the workouts written for the week. It's just like, uh, I'll say in the morning of that day, I'll be like 500 for 10, 500 for 10, and I'll visualize it throughout the day. I remember doing that. And then you're just on autopilot by the time you get there. So that's why it's important to like, if you're really into working out and you want to make progress to like program your whole month. And I think that becomes like, uh, uh, like planning, right? I think planning is very important for diet. So if you're going to follow the ketogenic diet, one thing that I think is important to conversation to have is that the family needs to be on board and they need to make it, uh, they need to make it, uh, less painful for the individual, because I know in, in my house, you know, if there's a lot of chocolate or something, or if there's, there's things in sight accessibility, it's like someone who has a drug problem the biggest factor in influencing that drug problem is availability. And with the internet, I mean, it made a lot of things very available for people, but if a cocaine addict has cocaine in the house and they know it's in the house, then they're gonna use it, right? So accessibility is one of the first big levers you have to pull for ketogenic diet adherence. One of the reasons pornography addiction is so difficult yeah. for everyone is so widely available and easily accessible. Ian, any more questions? That's all from me. <laughs> I just, I just want to thank you so much for being so generous with your time and uh, talking this for almost two hours and I thank you very much. And yeah, man. Thank yeah, you. It's just, I just think this is the most epic episode we've ever had because so much of totally what you epic. said to just completely resonates with bipolar people from the neuroscience research you've done to 
you know, we're talking about lactate in the blood and uh, neural yeah. membrane potentials. And these all are things that people with bipolar are really interested in if they're interested in the science. And also, um, thank you for setting benchmarks for deadlifting for us all that we will gradually try and work towards then. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but yeah, and, and, and I think as well, just what you said about like so many people with bipolar are going through this intense suffering and, and the kind of meaning you derive from that and purpose is something that's really inspiring that you've demonstrated. And so I think people will really connect with that and appreciate you sharing that. I think that, um, so thank you for, uh, thank you for spending time with us today and uh, thank you for all that you're doing to um, spread word about these therapies and thank you for um, putting all your effort and time and energy behind this uh, metabolic psychiatry, which is really encouraging for people like us who feel like this has always been kind of like a, bipolar has been always like the underlook condition that's tagged on to other studies and stuff and it's really yeah. awesome tough uh, amazing people like yourself uh, 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 researching this and moving forward so thank you so much well, Dom, thank I you like guys. That, one last note. I like. I love yeah. that you're this. You're you know kind of jacked guy, but then you come in with the science, the intellect, the compassion, etc. That's like the kind of man that I'm striving to be myself. So thank you for that, and thank you very much for coming on. I, I definitely echo that sentiment. Thank <laughs> you very much. It was it was an ultimate pleasure, guys. Thank you, and thank you for your, like I said, your just courageous advocacy to talk about your own. Uh, you know, struggles and, and creating this platform for researchers to talk about this. And uh, if they want to hear more, you know, about this, uh, the Metabolic Health Summit, we're going to really be highlighting this topic because we've realized over the years that this is, this topic needs more and more, the more exposure, the better. So if we can provide a platform, we intend to do that and really blow this thing up as much as possible. So uh, thanks again, having, thank you for having me on your platform. And I look forward to sharing this with, with other people when it becomes available. Thank you. Yes, sir.